Hello, and welcome to another episode of Django Chat, a weekly podcast on the Django web framework. I'm Will Vincent, joined as always by Carlton Gibson. Hello, Carlton. Hello, Will. And this week, we're going to talk about caching, which is a power tool of all developers, but may not be familiar to uh, folks newer in their career. And Django has some fantastic built-in support, so we're going to get into all things caching. So, Carlton... What is caching? Why is it important? So, oh, oh good. Caching is good if you, uh, you know, say you've got some database query that takes quite a long time and you're doing it all the time. Maybe you want to cache that. And that just means keep it hanging around so you don't have to make it again. And ideally, your cache, get fetching, so if you store a result that you got from the database, you can put it in your cache. And it, ideally, it's quicker to get it back from the cache than it is to go to the database. That's the idea. So performance, right? Yeah, and that general idea that rather than spinning up the physical disk, if you load it into memory like the RAM, it's going to be faster. That's the general idea. Yeah, it I mean, be applied to... sometimes you might c- cache on the disk, though, for instance. Um, yeah, if there's a, true. I don't know, you're comp- rendering a complicated template and you've, you've taken, you know, you've gone to the database, you've got some data, you've rendered it into a template. There's no reason why you, you've got then some HTML out of that, which was computationally expensive. There's no reason why you couldn't rec- cache that on the disk because then all you've got to do is fetch it from the disk and serve it straight away rather than do all that heavy computation before but normally normally we cache in RAM yeah and we'll get into where where you can put the cache but that's the basic idea is you you pre-process things so they can be loaded faster um, and I, I mean I think something that's maybe a little confusing is it's such a broad idea caching I mean so if you index a database if, if folks have heard of that that's basically a cache but then you can also in Django you can well for example Django has a built-in caching system uh, where We'll get to where you store it, but there's four options to give folks a sense of how to think about this, where you can do per site, so you can just cache everything. So if you have a Django site, but it's basically a static site, if it's a blog that's not changing, you can just do a, I think it's basically one line, we'll link to this in the docs, and just per site cache everything. And so after the first time, the first time it loads, someone will come in, hit the site, it actually needs to process, but then after that, everything is just served from memory. Um, and actually, on that topic, let's talk about uh, refreshing the cache hot and cold, because I think that's an important thing. Because there's this idea that you know, a cache has to be run, it has to be hot. So for example, if I've changed, I have a blog, simple blog site, I add a new blog post, the first person who comes and hits that site is, going, is not going to be cached, even if I have caching run. So either I just say, well, the first, folk, the first person who comes in is going to take that performance hit, or you can... Um, heat you can what's the term I, you can run the cache in advance i never know what the terms for these things are but you can preheat <laughs> the cache right so what you can do yeah is when it's you something pu- when, you, pu- heat when you publish your own blog post you can go and check that it appeared on the site and in so doing it will load and then it will be cached in your your page so normally you cache per page right like Django's got this nice page caching option where you like each individual page has a so right so yeah so the four options per site per view uh template which I guess is what you mean by per page. I think so. Oh, I, I can never remember. Then you can things. get into the low-level cache API. So this is something you want to play with in reality. So in production, like you can make predictions all day long on local usage, but you really just want to see how your site actually performs. But I would say with, God, we're just butchering this, heating up the cache, warming up the cache. I played around with this a ton. And on a big site, it's worth it, maybe. But it's also fine to just say, you know, if I have thousands of visitors, the first one on this page, when I do a change, it can be a little slower for them and they'll live. Yeah, like the pay, the pay I mean, what's good about the <laughs> caching, right? So the pay, however long it takes to go and get your blog post out of your database, to render it into the template, put it on the page. Right, okay, the first time that's a bit slow. And then the index page needs to change as well, because that, you know, the one where it lists the first five blog posts, the most recent five blog posts, you need mm-hmm. to update that. So questions about invalidation that we can come back to in a minute but uh, so that first the first person who loads that is a bit slow if that's you brilliant right well i i did that i i manually again this is early days a <laughs> startup i would manually go th- uh, manually go through and uh reheat god uh these pages um but you know in practice when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of users it all is a comes, over, comes out a tidal so wave did you have your, so would you set this to cash forever no I don't think you want to do that. I mean, you could if you're updating it all the time. I recall setting it for a very long period of time, though off the top of my head, I can't remember what a long period of time is. I think maybe it was a, a month. Oh, right. Well, that is quite a long uh, time. I mean, I've, I, uh, the thing is... And I mean, usually it's like a, like a, a week or a day yeah, is a long a day period of time. Or even an hour, right? Because like, let's say you've yeah. got one person coming and hitting your Django application once an hour. 
it's really not going to kill your Django application, right? But if you've got 20,000 people all at once, that will kill it. So if you can cache that blog post, even for an hour, it means that the, the Django app is only really doing the hard work once every hour or once every day or once every week. Yeah. And again, I, I'm thinking of this, this was very early stage with a startup. Um, yeah, I think so. So there's a timeout. So there's arguments you can pass into the cache, uh, caching framework built into Django. And I mean, the docs give an example of um, 300 seconds. So five minutes as you know, substantial period of time. Yeah, I, th I think all that what I said was way too long. Well, but, whatever. You know, like, again, it doesn't... Play, play around with it. You know. <laughs> this is why you want logging and other information too on your site so you can see actually how fast the page is loading. Um, you know, it's a balancing act, but, basically. So, but in general, cache everything. Yeah, I mean, in the, before we go on and talk about the details of Django caching, there's another layer to think about, which is could you get Nginx or whatever um, front-end proxy you've got to do it set, um, instead? Because um, Nginx mm. will serve files off the file system, you know, far more efficiently than any application you can ever write. And so... If you've got a blog post, which perhaps you update, I don't know, never. Why not tell Nginx to cache it on the file system? And then it's just like Nginx, for Nginx perspective, it's just like it's serving a static site and it's like not even talking to your backend. And that's really quite easy to configure. You, you give it a path and you say, look, file cache, and you you give it the module, the, the amount of time you want to cache it for, and it will just do it. Um, so that's worth what considering. Do you, what do you make? I remember um, using Varnish, mm -hmm. which is a... A proxy cache layer. Um, when I was doing this all on DigitalOcean, yeah. what's what's your take on Nginx versus Varnish? Well, I mean, you okay. you could use both, yeah, right? Because they yeah, do different people things. People do. So for for me, for your, I mean, I remember Varnish was like a huge speed bump, yeah. maybe the biggest of all the things. I did. Right, but so Varnish is a dedicated extra layer that you can um, you can use and super powerful. But I I always say you don't go to these things until you need it, right? So your what's your yeah. what's your base set? <laughs> I did not do that, right, of but course. what's your base setup? Your base setup is you know, just for example, I mean, you might be using Apache or whatever, but let's just go with one example. You're using Nginx with Garnicorn with Django, okay? You've already got Nginx in play, and it's it's got first grade um, caching module that's really easy to configure. You can use that, and that will that will really will cope with you know, probably 90% of sites out there, that's perfectly good enough. And then if you are really yeah. pushing it to limit, then you're going to investigate whether or not you need another dedicated caching layer on top. And I would say this is the type of stuff that is, it's really fun to do because you can, at the end of the day, you can say, oh, I increased my, you know, or decreased my load time by X amount. It sort of scratches that developer itch, but it is, I'm certainly guilty of spending way too long getting that last five, 10% when it was totally unwarranted. <laughs> so it, um, I would say be aware that this is f fun and feels binary. Um, and so a lot of times you'll you know neglect things like talking to users that is a little more gray. <laughs> or, you know, marketing, <laughs> or any of that stuff. Marketing, yeah, all these things, design. Um, okay, so where do you put the cache? So let's talk about, so it, historically, so memcache was the, f what, the first big popular caching layer, though these days I think Redis Almost everyone would say Redis. If you're starting from scratch, you would use. I think people like Redis. It's got some fancy. I mean, Redis is a little bit simpler, or no, it's not. But it's a little bit faster for sure. Is it? Is that the case? Uh, I, I believe mm. so. I, there, I've seen. We'll link. There's a detailed analysis. I believe in most cases it's actually faster. Okay. I mean, look back in the day, and so we're talking, um, you know, early 2000s. Memcache was the option. You'd run Memcache. You'd be there even into. And it was this amazing idea, right? Because it came out of. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I remember like it came out what, like Live Journal or something in 2005. Like it was, I don't, I think it was like the first major uh, caching of that type. Yeah, and it just did the job, um, the job, and it did it very well and massive adoption because of that. Um, and still put brilliant, right? It still works, and no, no reason what not to use memcache unless you're already thinking about using Redis. And again, it's like how many components do you want in your stack? So if you've got Redis running. Why not use Redis as a, ca as a cache backend? Right. So I guess yeah, the general thing, um, memcache is a little bit simpler. But if you if you need if you're going to need Redis things anyways, you might as well just use Redis for all of it. Um, well, so let's talk about those things. Why would you use Redis? So I mean, basically for any queue like task. So email is one example. Um, what are some other examples that come to mind of when you would 
so so I guess we're I'm confusing two things here. So there's caching, and then you'd also use something like Redis for queue based. Yeah. So why processes. would you have Redis? Yeah, because you want to you want to use a queue. So let's take a good queue package. So you know everyone always talks about Celery, but Celery's overkill for you know the the majority of use cases. So what's a good package? Well, there's one called Django Queue, which I love and have fun with. That's nice and simple, and that's got a Redis backend. So you pip install Red, or you know apt install Redis, and then you pip install Django Queue into your project. You know a little bit of settings magic, and you're up and running. What do you put in there? Anything that you want to put out band. So you know you're rendering a PDF. You're right. resizing something that's going to be process you're intensive. That would sending an email. You're doing any of these tasks that we talked about. We talk about all the time, and then you've got you've already at that point you've got Redis in play, so you might as well use it as your Django cache backend. For which you'll need a couple of packages or a package. There's a couple of options, right? There's Django Redis and Django Redis Cache. And I can never remember what the difference is between these two ones. <laughs> Every single time I start a new project, I have to go and search for history. What did I use last time? And is it still as good? Yeah. I, well, I was just updating uh, my awesome Django repo, which has um, a bunch of curated third party apps. And I was going through the exact same thing because, you know, there's a, a Redis section. And I was like, oh, what is the difference? Like, uh, there is a difference, but it's, I can't remember I have either. No off the top idea. Of my head. Like I, so I, I was looking this up before we started the talk. Last time I did it, I used Django Redis cache. I've been very happy with that. It turns out I've used that loads of times in the past, but I've also used Django Redis loads of times in the past, and I have no <laughs> idea why. I don't know which one's good. Yeah, just don't peek under the rug. Yeah, it there was some talk well. about um, bringing a, a Redis um, cache backend into core. I think the general the state of play on that is yeah, we we keen on that but it needs a Django enhancement proposal a dep it needs someone to step up and, and write the thing um but in principle mm. in a you know two three four versions time when someone's actually got around and, and written it there might be redis yep. cache backend in Django itself yeah because it, it really is on a decent sized site pretty much a guarantee you're going to have Red, redis or memcache but probably redis these days yeah and you do want caching i mean like you know just the, t the one thing we haven't talked about it's not just the pages but the template fragments sometimes templates are computationally mm. expensive to render and if you've got i don't know let's say you're converting um user submitted markdown to html okay first of all you've got to render that as html using markdown and then you've got to run it through a sanitizer like bleach which uses html5 lib which is not necessarily the fastest library in the whole world you if you can cache the output of that rendering then the next time you have to do it i mean you could cache it in the database say say you've got that markdown stored in a model field you could have an extra model field for it for the rendered html you could do it at save time but mm -hmm. equally you might do it by caching the template fragment yeah and I, i'm thinking this would be a great tutorial to do because for local development just so folks can see that this actually works if you just have django debug toolbar which in addition to showing queries will show a uh, local page load time, which again, isn't a proxy for production, but it gives you some sense. If you just flip around the switches for per site per view and just see how much faster it is. I mean, it is orders of magnitude faster, obviously to serve from a cache. So I would say that would be the way to play around with it is just, just simply Django debug toolbar. Um, and then you can, there's more complex tools to see how fast in production your pages are loading. Yeah, reality, r really speaking, if you've used one of these M APM tools, these, uh, these profilers, these these live production profilers that monitor your, your execution time, you will see that the number one place where you're losing time is trips to the database. And the number two time where you're losing time is rendering um, templates. So, yeah. you know, if you can... If, well, after, you know, doing something stupid with front end, not stupid, but doing something with front end assets like huge images or something ah like right okay but here, okay so here's here's the interesting thing with caching right is is there's actual time the time your django application took to serve the response versus the perceived time that the user had on the endpoint so you know let's say your am your django application took 300 milliseconds to 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 go to the database render the template serve the response you know that seems is that fast is that slow who knows but let's say you're loading you know two megabytes of javascript which took two and a half seconds to be responsive and to load on the on the client the client isn't going to notice if you half your response time from your django application they're just not going to notice yeah. because it pales into insignificance so right quite often you'll see the front end people talk about this a lot the dominant factor in perceived responsiveness is how fast your page loads to the user so i how much javascript yeah, are you perceived. loading how much how many images are you i mean the images aren't even the thing it's javascript how much javascript are you loading how long right. does that take to pull yeah. into the page especially if you're doing one of these um 
uh, single page application, these, these um, client side rendered things where it's got to load all the JavaScript, then it's got to pull the um, data from, from an API. And that's the bit where your Django app does its thing and it takes 300 milliseconds. And then it's got to render all that into the page before the user says, oh yeah, the page loaded. Right. And that whole perceived time, I mean, it reminds me of, it, so Instagram back when it came out, because um, I was actually working at Quizlet, like just next door to them. Um, one of the things besides filters, one of the things that I remember being a wow moment was, so this was still when the uh, cell reception in San Francisco was terrible. A lot of places, what they did is they, as soon as you, you picked a image, you wanted to load and start typing in all the information in the background, they started loading it. So it felt really fast. You didn't, you know, press the button and then wait five, 10 seconds. It felt instantaneous. And I'm sure some others had done it, but that was one of the first apps I saw that, you know, basically said, we're going to, we're going to blow up your bandwidth or your cell phone plan, but it, you know, in the background, and now that's a standard process. Anytime, I don't know, Tumblr or something, or, or Instagram still, I'm, you know, when you're loading an image, first thing you do is you load the image and then you type in a whole bunch of stuff in the background. It's already processing. So you can just click the button and go load it. Yeah. And I think the reality of, you know, you can, you can, Django gives you these caching tools and you can use it to speed up your Django response. But in a lot of cases, the real work is on the front end and, you know, do the basics yep. in Django, get it, get it performant, use, use that Nginx caching layer that we talked about, but don't sit there then worrying about micro optimizations when you've got a front end app that's likely to offer better return on investment for that optimization time. Right. And I guess in the last I guess major point I would say is it really, it, it depends. Yeah. It depends on the type of app that you have. How often is the data updated? Is it personalized for every user? So for, if you think of Facebook, you know, every, you and I log, not that I have Facebook, um, but if I did, you and I log in, there's different content being loaded there. I'm sure, I know that in the background, Facebook is periodically loading those things into cache. So when you log in, it's there, but how often does that change? If you have a timeline feed or Twitter, right? I mean, that's updating quite a lot. Yeah. So that would be a little more challenging than a blog or something that doesn't update as much where you can be a lot more uh, aggressive with the time limits that you uh, yeah, and when, set yeah, when and like, yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's it's like, how aggressively can you cache it? It's like for a, for a static blog post, and do you have a mechanism for invalidating it, right? So let's say you've cached a blog post in your you know Redis whatever using the Django backend. Are you able to identify that by um, key such that when you update it, you can, you know, use, you can, when you, in your save handler, wherever you put that save handler, you can say, oh, and invalidate the cache. So there's, there's two problems in computer right. science, right? Naming things, caching validation, and off by one errors. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I guess the last point I would make is uh, the cache is not an infinite supply. It's not the database. So often you are finding yourself, you're like, well, I'll just cache everything all the time. But um, it's more expensive than uh, database space. Yeah, so this, but this is where file system caching comes back into its own, right? So everyone's like, right, let's go straight from RAM. Well, RAM can, can yeah. get expensive, but file system can be cheap. And, you know, it's this, it, so there's this, um, you know, when there's this idea about the, the different latencies of different things, you know, L1 cache, blah, 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 all the way down to yep. um, reading something off the disk and, or getting something over the network it's like how far up that scale can you move your relevant thing it's just a question of thinking about you know your requirements and your performance things and all the rest you know it's like algorithm design all over again yeah and it's i mean again it's for an engineering mind it's sort of fun because it feels black and white and you can see your progress um i would at last point i would mention so there's a there's a book that's a couple of years old at this point but still very relevant called high performance django by the folks at lincoln yeah, super that uh, talks about caching, but talks about a lot of these performance because this all comes around performance. So that's definitely worth a look. Um, we'll put the link for that in the show notes. Um, yeah. They, so yeah. So oh end of the. I was just going to say there was some. Old, no. for, for, I remember when I was learning back in the day, and there was some there were some really good books on this sort of stuff, and uh, you know from O'Reilly and you know all the rest of them. I don't. You I don't know what O'Reilly the latest published books. Yeah, I don't know what the latest scaling books are, or you know what the latest you know high performance web application type things books are, web scalability that kind well, of. Thing. Well, if I may indulge a slight rant, so I was updating my awesome Django repo where I have a book section, and there's still like almost no up to date books, up to date being you know actually written in the last couple of years books on Django because it changes all the time. So it's not that the advice, especially around this stuff, is wrong, but I would love to know about more up-to-date things. I mean, as far as I know, the, um, 
So Tango with Django just released an updated book. That's a classic that's been around. Um, but there's still, I still think I'm almost the only one with 2.2 versions of my books. Oh, okay. um, so it's, yeah, if, if you think of, if you find those, we'll, we'll put them in the show notes. But um, that, you know, it, it's, it's nice in a way that that's the stuff that doesn't change as much. I mean, that's the, the, the challenge and opportunity for me as a content creator is I have to update things all the time, which be, can become tiring, but also makes me do it better. But it means that a lot of, um, I, I sort of look longingly at these things like um, algorithms and stuff that are more but, permanent. But I would argue, I would argue that the, the, the principles of sort of um, web application scaling haven't really altered in the, the, the 15 no. years that I've been sort of looking at it. Like it's, it was the, That's the, true. the advice yeah, the was the same back a little then bit, as it the... is now. And, you know, maybe version numbers have changed, but not, you know, not the actual way you go about it. The point is, though, since you already know how to do it quite well, that 5%, 10% that's changed doesn't throw you off. Yeah, that's it. Whereas, it's, it's difficult to um, for example, yeah. people ask me all the time, what's the difference in the book between 2.0, 2.1, 2.2? It's about uh, 10, 15% actually different content. And if you already know Django, it won't throw you off. But if you don't know Django, which is why you bought the book, it will definitely throw yeah, you no, off. Those, the, um, yeah, those differences are fatal. Oh, what, you know, I've got, it, it says 2.2 <laughs> and I've got 1.8. What's going on here? Like, you know. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember being you know. in that exact position. I couldn't, I, you know, hating barriers and my wall, head on the wall for ages. Anyway, that's a cheerful <laughs> note to finish on. <laughs> yes. All right. So caching is important. Um, hopefully this episode helped you all out. We are, as ever, at the DjangoChat.com website. We are Chat Django on Twitter. The episodes actually are also on YouTube, the audio only, if you prefer that. I keep putting them up there. And there are some subscribers, but if you prefer YouTube, uh, go check it out. We'll see you all, all right, next join time. Join us next time. Bye-bye.